Well, good morning. Welcome to the NCSA Colloquia series. I'm very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Margaret Hedstrom from the University of Michigan. Margaret is uh, the Robert M. Warner Collegiate Professor of Information in the School of Information at the University of Michigan. She has a long history of working in digital archiving and preservation, both as a scholar and a practitioner. Before joining the faculty at Michigan in 1995, Margaret was um, Chief of State Records Advisory Services and Director of the Center for Electronic Records at the New York State Archives and Records Administration. During her 10-year tenure, uh, ten tenure, that's another one, try to say that fast, <laughs> she was named as a fellow of the Society of American Archivists. In 2008, the Library of Congress recognized her as a uh, digital preservation pioneer, citing a long list of publications that are still timely and influential. Among these is her 1991 article, Understanding Electronic um, Incunabula, um, a framework for research on electronic records, uh, published in the American Archivist, which paved the way for the research challenges posed by the emergence of the digital order. She was an author of It's About Time, Research Challenges in Digital Archiving and Long-Term Preservation, 2003, sponsored by the Digital Government Research Program and the Digital Libraries Program Directorate um, from SIZE um, at the National Science Foundation and the Library of Congress's uh, National Digital Information Infrastructure and Preservation Program. Margaret currently serves as PI of the NSF uh, SEED DataNet project, providing end-to-end -end data services for managing, sharing, and preserving data across a broad range of physical and social science disciplines. She also leads the NSF Open Data Integrative uh, Graduate Education and Research Traineeship, so this IGERT uh, program, uh, to generate new policies, practices, and technologies for data sharing in both the fields of bioinformatics and material science and engineering. Her Michigan faculty profile reads, data sharing isn't always as easy as it sounds. Numerous hurdles need to be overcome from technological and organizational standpoints. I think we can all agree with that. Um, in this age of big data and data sharing, Margaret helps remind us that the technical challenges we face are often just the tip of the iceberg. Please join me in welcoming Margaret. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back at NCSA and to see many of the people I've been collaborating with here over the last seven or eight years on designing and then building the SEED project and uh, many other friends and colleagues. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to talk today about our current knowledge and capacity around digital archiving. And um, I'm going to do this at a pretty high level, uh, in part because I tend to look at problems and issues at a pretty high level, but also because I don't think we have a very good comprehensive or integrated view of what we mean by archiving, what the various components of that is, and as a consequence, we are challenged to build useful and affordable infrastructure for long-term access and reuse of scientific research data. Um, I want to also start by saying I'm pulling out a lot of observations from um, I'm, I'm pulling out a lot of observations from three projects that I've been involved in in the last five years or so, um, and maybe a little bit the Open Data IGERT as well, but specifically the Seed Project, um, the. National Academy's uh, research study committee for the National Research Council on digital curation, education, and workforce issues, which I chaired, and also um, a current project funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation called the Stewardship Gap. And these are really three unrelated projects, but they overlap in a way that um, I'm using this as an opportunity to reflect on what are some of the common issues and uh, that we see um, and where might we 
try to approach the archiving issue from a more holistic perspective. So I'm really going to talk about three aspects of this problem. Um, what we know about holes and gaps and maybe even chasms in our current archiving capacity. Uh, and then I'm going to talk briefly about our shared goals for knowledge generation um, so that we can enhance our archiving capacity not for the sake of storing more data or keeping more data or getting more citations to data sets, but we can do it in such a way that it really helps us meet some pretty profound global challenges. And then I'm going to close with just some observations and comments on roles and responsibilities. I hope that we will have time for a discussion afterwards, um, because I'd love to hear what you all have to say and contribute um, to what I think is a conversation that is probably long overdue. Um, I, my definition of archiving capacity is the ability to store and retrieve scientific data for meaningful reuse at an affordable cost to society for as long as the data has value. <coughs> or put more succinctly, the ability to store the right data to meet current and future demand at a cost society is willing to bear. Um, this definition, which I just cooked up a couple days ago, is somewhat different from, I think, what you would normally see. Being able to store more big data, being able to provide faster access to data, um, by, um, having data in a more standard form, um, getting cheaper storage, whatever. Um, and I'm really, in my own thinking, trying to focus on building capacity to meet a demand, known or unknown. So I want to first uh, make a few comments on um, some of the challenges we currently have to measuring our archiving capacity. Everybody or I should say most people, I assume most people in this room at least, think we should have greater capacity in this area. But how do we measure it? And how do we know what is missing and what um, we ought to be investing in? So one of the things that comes across in um, a number of studies, and this was uh, brought to my attention through the uh, NRC study committee, is that the cost of storage is largely independent of the cost of archiving. Or one might say the cost of archiving is independent of the cost of storage. And what, we, what I mean by that is um, that one could store a very large data set if it's simple, uniform, um, and well understood, perhaps at a much lower cost than one can archive thousands or tens of thousands of separate data sets that consume the same amount of storage space. Um, and it's easy to measure storage cost. I mean, those of you who are experts in that will say, well, that's not easy either. But um, it is a commodity that has a price associated with it and associated services that may um, influence that cost. Um, but there's a lot more to archiving and a lot more cost to archiving than just storage. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, another challenge um, to measuring our capacity is we really don't know much about the current and future demand for data. And that raises a lot of issues, um, including what is you know, something that is often said, which is, well, we don't know what data anybody's going to want in the future, so we should just save it all. Um, and that is a way of spreading a finite amount of resources for archiving over 
a massive amount of data, and that may not be the best way to make investments in archiving. Um, this notion of meaningful reuse is pretty nebulous. And, but, and I want to say a little bit more about that. But if we're going to invest in long-term archiving of data or data sets, we want to do so in such a way that in the present or the future, whoever does discover them can actually reuse them. And by reuse them, I mean do new forms of, of analysis, combine them with other kinds of data, draw inferences from them that are understood because there's enough information about the nature of the data and its limitations, all of those kinds of things. Um, and then value is very difficult to determine in the absence of predictable demand or some demonstrably um, meaningful reuse. So these are sort of conundrums um, that are obviously <coughs> connected and, and, and challenging, but I wanted to just make the point that we are challenged in measuring the costs and the benefits and the demand for um, reusable scientific data. The, the ways that we currently um, try to measure capacity is by counting things, like the numbers of research data repositories, and there's a, a couple of examples. Um, the total number of files or the total amount of data archived often by repository, by subject, by discipline, or by institution. Um, and uses, usage data. Um, how many times was a data set viewed or downloaded? And then tracking citations to that data. And what I want to suggest here is that these are measures. They are counts of things and they are measures. But they are not necessarily indicators of either the capacity to archive the right data for to meet current and future demand, um, nor are they very good indicators of um, a more consolidated view of, as a country, what capacity do we have for archiving the research data we're producing. Um, so some of the gaps and holes we have right now are, are in the metrics. We have a lot of supply-driven metrics. We know X field is producing X terabytes of X kind of data. Um, and there's a lot of it, and it's increasing. So we know a lot about the supply. Um, we have repository-driven metrics. How many repositories of what kind, with which types of data, for which disciplines exist? Um, we know a little bit about the costs. And in particular, we know that from a repository's perspective, Acquiring and ingesting data, curate and curating it, we know that ingestion, curation, and storage costs. Um, we don't know much at all about um, the cost to deliver and disseminate data. Uh, and we know very little about the value, the value of what, to whom, and when. And consequently, there are common value propositions about you know, archiving data is necessary and valuable to support you know, new discoveries. But that is so abstract that we don't have, as I said earlier, um, good even case studies or examples of what that value, where that value has been derived, what that meaningful reuse is, um, 
and I think that makes it challenging to um, get beyond kind of broad platitudes about why we should be uh, involved in this. Um, I think I'm trying to look at this problem also from more of an infrastructure perspective. And one of the things that is clear in looking at, you know, what we do know based on the limited metrics we have and the caveats that I've presented about those is that our archiving capacity is very fragmented. Um, we have thousands of entities that provide one or more of the following services. We acquire data, curation services, storage with a commitment to long-term preservation, and some degree of access, discovery, and dissemination. Thousands may be a um, understatement. If we think about researchers, labs and researchers who indicate that they will um, fulfill their data management and data sharing responsibilities by storing their data on their lab computer with a lim little bit of metadata and um, they'll put the URL, URL up for their lab repository, um, then we're talking about millions. Um, the, the archiving capacity is also fragmented by discipline, domain, by type of data, by topic, by the origin, where was the, you know, where, where was the team based, by funding source, by size, by complexity format, et cetera. And these factors often govern which entity is going to take responsibility for long-term archiving. Now, um, part of the issue with this is that the, the flow of data into the, this fragmented and largely disconnected set of repositories is neither predictable nor logical. And because a lot of the discovery mechanisms and capabilities for how you can reuse data are defined by the repository in which the data lives, um, you, you have to kind of know where it is to know where to find it. And that is, I think, one of the real challenges with the infrastructure that we have and, and the demand. Um, and I think um, right now, researchers actually have numerous objects for archiving common, simple, small data sets in common formats. Increasingly, you can deposit your data in, um, in a publisher repository, in FigShare, in your institutional repository, in a domain repository, in any number of other services out there provided that it is small, it is stable, it is flat, um, but th there are few, if any, options for complex, large digital objects and collections. Um, and I'm concerned myself that part of what we're doing in trying to increase our archiving capacity is to produce more services so that researchers have more options for archiving the kinds of data that we know how to deal with. And, um, and the resources that are going into that are not going into some of the more challenging problems that might be much more significant for um, science. Um, another challenge that we face in kind of looking at archiving capacity, if one of the goals is to archive data for 
meaningful reuse at a price society is willing to bear is that um, the benefits of archiving are both abstract and latent. Um, and as I said, we make arguments about the importance of this based on um, generalities about how it will improve science, it'll generate new knowledge, it will um, increase the trust in science because people will be able to replicate results. Um, and latent in the sense that data that's archived may not actually be re reused for years or decades or in some cases even centuries. At the same time, the costs are both concrete and immediate. And um, one of the things that we do know about if looking from a, from a sort of institutional perspective is that um, the largest cost component to repositories is acquisition and ingest. In other words, the process of moving scientific data from the lab or the researcher's own um, laptop or server into an archiving environment requires um, almost, it requires a, a great deal of translation in terms of formats, metadata, representation, and often value, a lot of the value that, that um, researchers and research groups have added to that data gets lost in the shuffle, and then there's an effort to reconstruct it so that the data can be reused. Um, we also know that human labor costs for manual curation are the largest cost component to repositories, uh, but lacking um, kind of unified processes that for curation that we could automate and apply intelligence to. Um, we don't have a good means for defining what kind of automated tools we ought to be building in this area. Um, also, I think that we don't measure what it costs researchers to manage and prepare their data for submission. And I think the largest challenge here with our current strategies and our division of roles and responsibilities is that we, <coughs> mainly to contain the costs of archiving, we try to shift them between researchers and repositories. So for example, um, there's a lot of effort underway on the part of both long-standing repositories and new organizations that are getting into the research data archiving business to educate and in some cases train researchers how they should manage their data, what metadata should they provide, what kind of file formats will be acceptable for long-term archiving, uh, what some of the intellectual property and privacy and other policy issues are around that, so that the researchers will do more of that curation work up front. At the same, and that way, you know, you can reduce these, these costs at ingest and the intense cost of manual curation, except researchers want to do science and research. And um, their way of containing the amount of time and effort they spend on curation is to say, I'm done with my project. Here's my data. Take it or leave it. And as, as a consequence of this disconnect, we don't have a good strategy for reducing 
this overall cost of archiving as a process that really starts at the beginning and um, of the researcher's own conceptualization, collection, and creation of data and ends when someone takes that data, reuses it, and creates a new set of data that may need to be curated. Um, so, you know, currently we have um, this divided set of, of roles and responsibilities and um, assumptions, I think, on both sides that everybody is doing their part to the best of their ability. But we don't have a good understanding of what would, um, what would motivate people to um, do more or better or less of what is on this uh, list here. So I want to start, I want to say a little bit uh, quickly about um, the seed vision and part of what we have done with seed. Um, seed, as some of most of you know, maybe, but I'll just say seed um, is one of the NSF data net projects. It is a collaboration between the University of Michigan, the University of Illinois, and Indiana University. And we are um, just starting our sixth and final year of the SEED project in its current instantiation. Um, one of our goals, and there were many, but from an archiving in, an infrastructure perspective was to create an environment where research, da research, data management, and archiving are integrated into a unified process. And as a consequence of trying to do that, to allow um, researchers to kind of go about doing their work as much, in as much the same way as they know how to do it or are doing it, but being able to capture um, their knowledge about their data as they are creating it and sharing it and analyzing it. And we call that um, active curation. Um, and we um, also wanted to support sharing and exchange of data among trusted partners in this environment where project leaders and team members can control who can have access to it. And we've done this um, by building a, a platform now based on Clouder for project spaces where uh, researchers, individuals, but more likely teams and groups of researchers can set up a, a project space. And um, we provide support for sharing data. We have controlled access um, and rights. And um, we've, we um, have about 40 willing partners um, actively using our, our new version of um, Seed 2.0, which just came out in, in July. Um, and so some, of the, some of the things that we've learned in this process, you know, this idea about sharing, it's, we have to stop thinking of it as a binary thing where either your data is yours or it's open to the whole world, but to think about sharing um, as something that where we grant, where researchers, as they feel comfortable, they understand their data, um, they feel as if they've exploited it as much as they can, or they're done doing what they're going to do with it, um, that they can gradually, during that process, open it up to more and more people. Because part of what one gets out of sharing uh, data, starting with trusted partners, like between a, uh, a, a professor and her graduate students, is knowledge and insight into some of the issues and problems with the data. 
and if we can capture that and move that through, uh, move that on with the data to repositories, then some of that curation work may not be necessary, and also we at least assume that the data will be more useful to people who want to reuse it in the present or future. Um, we built a pipeline to facilitate the flow of high quality data into repositories. And one piece of our vision was that, you know, the solution to archiving capacity is not necessarily to go and build more repositories. What could we do to leverage and enhance the capacity of repositories that already exist? So I want to say a little bit briefly about some of the challenges um, that we've faced in this process. Um, one of them is how, you know, being able to identify early on which data and which metadata and which analytical capabilities are necessary for meaningful reuse so that resources, energy, and attention can be focused not on all the data that ever flowed through my lab, but data that is worthy of some investment, be it of a scientist's time and effort, of uh, improving a tool for analysis, uh, or, you know, adding value to it, whatever. Um, that is very, that, that, that is a challenge that I think, um, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for, but I think relying on the instincts and insights of the people who create and initially use that, that data is um, likely to be a very um, helpful first step. Um, one of the things we found is that existing repositories have a limited capacity for large and or complex objects, whether they are large or not. And um, also limited expertise in managing some of the complexity of research data, and in particular things like versioning, multiple hierarchies, complex data models, um, scientific ontologies and provenance. And what repositories tend to do is to place constraints, understandably, no one wants to make a commitment to preserving something for the long term that you don't really know how to handle or manage or deliver, but limiting um, their ingest or acquisition or policies or scope of collecting to simple and relatively small data collections. And then the delivery of reusable data when to really reuse data you may also need a lot access to a lot of the analytical environment um, that that is I think a, a, a a growing challenge, um, not only for repositories, but um, for scientists themselves who are wanting to maintain their data over even, you know, five years or a decade. Um, I want to close with some good news and then say a little bit about roles and responsibilities. And um, I think one is that across this environment of science and research and libraries and archives and users and educators and citizen scientists, I think we probably have a shared set of goals um, to increase and accelerate scientific discovery and knowledge generation and actually to make that knowledge much more accessible to much to many more people, 
and to engage more people in that scientific discovery and knowledge generation process. I think we do have um, shared goals for archiving at scale. And by that, I mean being able to provide, over the long term, data that meets current and future, future demand at a price society is willing to bear. Um, clearly, we want high quality and trusted data. Um, I think more evidence of the impactful reuse of research data is something we aspire to. And um, affordable solutions so that most of the research investment is spent on research and not on you know, wrangling files and adding metadata and um, doing all those things that everybody says is necessary but nobody wants to either do or pay for. Um, so I want to say uh, briefly, you know, some thoughts about um, roles and responsibilities. Because laying out this problem at this high level, I think, um, does make it seem intractable. But we need to, d to recognize that archiving is a shared responsibility. There are certain things that researchers and scientists know about their data and about its value and about its quirks and uh, about how it was made um, that only they know. And, um, you know, there are certain pieces of information about the sausage factory that actually you might want to ask questions about or at least have the researchers provide when they hand their data off to someone else. At the same time, if researchers are actually producing data that is only reusable when its provenance is tracked, the, there are analytical tools available to do something with it, its quality is self-evident, then repositories need to step up and develop the capability to actually archive that data for the purpose of meaningful reuse. Um, I think there is a lot of work to be done in clarifying roles and responsibilities for policy, for infrastructure provision, for curation, quality control, storage discovery, delivery of reusable data. And one of the issues I think we, you know, the existing repository architecture tends to be sort of an end-to-end -end thing. So we store the data, we describe it, we uh, index it, we deliver it, we provide access to it. And that makes it very difficult to achieve scale where there are acceptable or um, common or commodity services that might provide some piece or pieces of that um, whole stack. And so I think we need um, to put um, more effort into building platforms and tools that do integrate the creation, analysis, uh, discovery, curation, reuse, and reuse of data. Um, and not do it by building more of what we already have, more, more fragments. We need some glue. Um, and, you know, the critical parties in this are the usual suspects. But I want to make, just call your attention to the one at, at the very bottom. We need to hear more from people who need access to data and who demand access to data. We have a model right now, which is we have a big problem. We've got a lot of data on our hands. 
We don't know exactly what to do with it. We don't know how, how much it'll cost to do it, and we don't know who should do what. Now that is not a very compelling argument for solving this problem. And I think if we could understand the demand and we could demonstrate the benefits, starting perhaps small with small examples, not the potential for nirvana of a whole new data world, but you know, real examples where the availability of reusable research data really made a difference. Then I think we're in a much better position to both gain support for archiving data and understand what it is we need to do to meet the demand and not to manage the supply. So I want to um, thank you all for listening, and I, you know, I hope we can have a little bit of a discussion. And um, I want to um, acknowledge the contributions of all these projects that I worked with. Um, so I've been trying to figure out how to phrase this question for a few minutes. I'm not sure if I've quite got it, but but as you're talking about this stuff, I'm kind of thinking in two directions. There's like data that we're generating and yet to be generated, and there's all this data we've got for the last hundred years that's that's in these different siloed repositories. I'm just curious if you have thoughts on can we afford to like look backwards and focus on trying to integrate existing data, or is this sort of a thought process that we really need to, to think about going forward because there's so much additional effort to try to, to, to handle all this data we already have that this is really a, a change in behavior going forward, if that makes sense? Um, so I think there are some really interesting and important um, efforts underway that we can learn from with regard to integrating legacy data that have been, that have been collected in the last three or 400 years and archived, but that reflect millennia. And one example of that is our efforts to create a long-term climate record, right? And, you know, one of the things we know is there's been a, lots and lots of effort to kind of make that data, to integrate that data, and to understand it, and to figure out where the holes are and all of that. But um, I am less concerned with that, because, you know, for one thing, we are learning from that, and the tools to do that kind of, of extraction and representation and integration are getting better, and more concerned about um, large amounts of complex data that have an unknown value in the future and do not have an obvious place to just hang out long enough until someone can figure that out. And you know, I, one of the things that, that, that I, I find that's, I think, what shall I say, um, a bit detrimental, but it's deeply embedded in the culture of archiving is like, if you can't hold on to it forever, then you know, why bother? We're not very comfortable with nudging things along um, and, you know, try to survive the first migration to a new platform, um, you know, try to uh, uh, keep the data usable enough so that when those new tools come along, you can actually do something with it. And um, as a consequence, sort of dumbing data down into little packages that we feel comfortable with and that, man, we can hold on to those forever, we're just not sure anyone will be able to do anything useful with them, is, um, is that's the kind of thinking that I am trying to break.
Okay, sorry. So uh, I was thinking a little bit about the equivalent of software and archiving and how it matches with data. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like software now has moved into a, a place where people work in a fairly standard way, uh, often using GitHub. Um, mm -hmm. And there is a fairly straightforward path then to archive software that's in GitHub into Zenodo or something else, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems like, I guess I wonder if there's any lessons that could be taken from software that could apply to data, or if it's the fact that software in the open source world at this point is such a, a culture of sharing that's kind of baked in, that the idea of archiving is, is not as important, but it's more the concurrent use and development that's more the important aspect. Um, so, I think the answer is yes, that we could learn a lot from the fact that software production has become much more collaborative and that through things like GitHub, documenting the code and recognizing the contributions of different people um, also provides a kind of better context for understanding that software. So could we develop similar processes that would work for data? I think that that is, I mean, that's something we were trying to do a bit, I mean, that we have done a bit in the SEED project. But um, I would also say that, you know, software is data, or software are data or that software often has to be wrapped with data and metadata to produce a reusable kind of complex object. And there, I think we have made pretty limited pro progress in thinking about how do we have both Process, well, processes, methods, and infrastructure for archiving software um, and matching up that software that's archived with the data that are dependent on it. Hey, thanks, Margaret. Um, I have a comment and a question if I can remember them both. So the the comments on the, the demand side, if you can get people to ask more for the data, and of course they don't do it now because it's not in the culture, the services around using the data, the raw data are not really useful, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the services aren't really there, et cetera. So I've always felt that working with publishers is a key thing to do because if you can have data associated with the publication uh, and there's a platform then to do either rep repurposing of the data you know, based on the publication or reproducing it or extending it and so on, people would be really mm -hmm. in motivated. And of course, publishers are afraid to ask for the data because they have no place to put it and they don't want to be bothered with curating it. And so, so that's why when I was at NSF, I had so many conversations with, with publishers around all of this. And so anyway, I just think there's a sweet spot there to increase the demand by working with publishers if you could provide the, the ability to, to connect it. But, but then, but then I, the, the real question I have, that's just sort of the comment, the question is more on the lines of there are so many things that we talk about why we should be um, having data services, like it accelerates discovery, it helps you, allows you to reproduce scientific work, it, there could be economic value, companies could get access to it, they could make things, fat, you know, the whole materials genome was based on that concept and so on. But we always fall short of actually working out the cost-benefit analysis. There must be a way to quantitatively estimate what is the value of proper data stewardship, say for the NSF to take mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm, we talk mm -hmm. about it, so I, I think it is part of the, the cost of doing research should also include the cost of data stewardship and disseminating the result in a responsible way and so on. But we've never really said, if you spent 2% of your budget, NSF, on this, you would re, you'd, it would be like the equivalent of an extra 50% in research funds or something like that. So has anybody ever really tried to estimate that and if not wouldn't that be a good thing to do to go back to the agencies and say look this is the analysis it's worth spending a billion dollars on data stewardship or whatever it is yeah um, I'm actually working on a proposal to try to do some of that 
um, to really, I mean, it's less on, the, more on the demand side, but on the cost side, I, d I did a back of the envelope calculation at some point about, there's some study that said that graduate students spend something like one third of their time wrangling data. And if you multiply what it costs to fund a graduate student by how many NSF has, that's a non-trivial amount of money. It's not, you know, it's not everything we need, but the point is um, redirecting some of those resources not only would help build out the capacity, it would free up the doctoral students to actually do research. And, you know, it seems so logical to me. Um, but I think we need to, to have, you know, some, some estimates. And, and I am actually very concerned that, you know, we measure what we can count and we measure the costs that we can count and that makes them, you know, very concrete. But we never bother to say, in your lab, how much time and effort goes into complying with your data management plan, for example. Um, we can say, well, you had to buy a new server and, you know, or you had to pay X amount for, you know, 50 terabytes of storage. But that's trivial. That is really, really trivial to the time spent um, by, by students, not just, you know, following some curation procedure. I discovered in the Eigert students, these were in material science, who were material scientists trying to figure out how to write scripts and programs that would take this data off of this instrument and actually transform it into something you could actually do and rather than doing it one off for each experiment, can we write a script? Hey, good idea. But what did you learn about materials doing that? You know, so I think, you know, definitely um, we have to figure out how to get over this, you know, let's, we're repositories, we can't afford to do everything we can do. Let's get the researchers to do more. And the researcher is saying, I am going to do as little as possible and I'll have fulfilled my responsibility and, you know, here's this bag of bits, you deal with it. I mean, we're not going to lower the costs of archiving unless we have that view. So I think that's a good suggestion. But that's related to the, the comment and question I wanted to, to get to, too. Um, doing a, a you know, cost-benefit analysis is great, but if you haven't provided a motivation for the individual researcher to do this, you're in trouble because they ultimately have to be play a role in this, as you, as you noted before. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you need to, something has to motivate them to do this. Um, the other is I think there's some cultural issues that, that still need to be, to be addressed, and, and I'll use a short story that, that I experienced a little uh, under a year ago. Uh, that sort of underscored this. So I was at a large facilities workshop, and uh, there was a discussion about retaining uh, large amounts of data from these large projects. Um, a dis and and I, I endorsed the notion of you can't keep all the data. Figure out what makes sense to keep. And they were having a discussion along these lines. And, and I made the comment during the discussion, I said, you're talking about trying to decide what data you keep and what data you don't keep, and there isn't an archivist in the room. Mm -hmm. And, and the response I got back was, well, they wouldn't know what data we should keep or not. And but, they were right. And, and, and they're, <laughs> they're absolutely right, but it meant they didn't understand the role of an archivist. And I think that they don't understand the role of folks from the library community in general and the value that they can bring to the process. So there's some, some other issues here that, that I don't know exactly how we wrestle, but they, there, there are some cultural and, and sort of lack of understanding issues that I think are also complicating. This is obviously a complex set of lots of issues and it's hard to talk about even one of them without touching several others because of the way they, they intricately inter intertwine. Mm -hmm. But on this cultural front, you know, I didn't know how to really respond to that other than to say, well, they don't actually decide what data. They help you decide what data. Yeah. And, and, and help to build processes for making those decisions. Um, but I, you know, beyond that, I didn't know how, be how best to respond to that kind of comment, and I didn't know if you 
had some advice on, on how to address those uh, when, we, when we come across them. So I think we really do need some predictive models around reuse and exactly what to base those on, um, I'm not sure because there's a whole interrelated set of factors. Where what we do know about from repositories that provide pretty uniform access, and in this I'm referring to um, uh, a, a, a dissertation by Kathleen Fear that used ICPSR data, um, but I think there's some other studies that demonstrate this too. Is you know if you follow power laws, and you know there's of the thousands of data sets in ICPSR, there's a few hundred that constitute, you know, 95% of what gets used. So we might start look, looking there. Now, wh what would explain that? Well, we're, you know, we don't really know, but is it the topic? Is it the, is it the quality? Is it that it's easy to discover? Is it it's easy to use? Is it that one important person cited it, and consequently, every graduate student in that field subsequently <coughs> cited that data set. I mean, we, th those are the kinds of things we need to figure out. But we've got to have better, we've, there's got to be a way that we can do a better job than to say, well, we don't know, so we'll save everything, or it's a crapshoot. And that's where we are right now, and I, and, and, and I, I I'm sorry to say that, but I mean, a lot of things have changed. We, we may be overly worried about any individual data set, you know, and, and so there's a granularity issue that comes into play, because there is a lot of substitutability now. I mean, we, we, we have, from the archival field, we have a, a model that was built around the idea that um, data, is really scarce, and you find the best thing you possibly can about that activity, now, you know, that's not our problem. It's not scarcity. And so what does a post-scarcity model of selection look like when we can't save everything? Nor do we really want to, in my view. But I think we, you've got to start by relying on scientists. And then you need some, some mechanism to have a bigger perspective on it. One question back there. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting talk. And um, one thing I was interested in as well is, uh, say, with the seed project, are you looking at different scientific disciplines and different scientific fields? And what kind of differences are you seeing between these fields, say, in terms of their norms around what data should be curated, whether it should be shared? Um, and if you're seeing any sort of particular cultural resistance in any fields to to actually uh, wanting to make data more openly available? So our initial target audience was a multidisciplinary field, sustainability science, which meant it had people across a very large spectrum of disciplines. Um, I, there's a v very large body of research on data sharing that tends to put discipline front and center, and um, I personally am not convinced that, I mean, there is variation, but there's also a lot of commonality, and I think what we've been trying to do in SEED is not focus on, you know, the differences, but trying to find out what are the common things that cross disciplines. Um, one of the things we did find is that you know, people don't want to just turn a switch and say my data is closed or it's open. They want to have different levels of control and access um, that there's, there are common services that go below the common, lowest common denominator, bag of bits. And there are very extreme customized demands for what people want. I don't think we've yet sorted out, you know, wh where's that sweet spot and where's that middle ground between um, the generic and the extremely customized. Whether that has to do with culture or not, I I'm not, I'm not sure. 
Yes, sir. Just a quick thing I, to kind of get at the point that John made and also we talked about, just to say if, if physical review letters were to say to John Rogers when he's publishing a materials paper or to Mike Norman when he's publishing an AppJ article, can we see the data? Uh, we'd, we'd like to associate that with your article. That would motivate people a lot, and they'd like to do that sort of thing, but they don't have the capacity now. So I just think there, there would be a sweet yeah. spot that would motivate a lot of people to take this a lot more seriously. Okay, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, let's thank Margaret again.